Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to CSIS here in Washington. I'm Jennifer Cook. I'm director of the Africa program here, and just want to welcome you all on a Monday night. Um, I'm here today with Carl Levan. Um, Carl is assistant professor um, with American University School of International Service. He's a professor of uh, comparative politics with a focus on African politics uh, and political theory. Uh, Carl has been a very good friend to CSIS over the years, um, particularly with his insights on Nigeria. And I have to say, uh, and this, this year is no exception, it's very easy when you're talking about Nigeria to kind of get pinballed around from development to development and personality to personality. Uh, and one thing I've always really appreciated about Carl is kind of the ability to step back a little bit from that. Um, look at some of the deeper patterns that are playing out in, 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 in driving uh, those political developments and those political personalities. So um, uh, I'm delighted that he's written this book about how political policy is made in, and um, public policy is made in Nigeria. I said, if, if you can answer that, you're, um, you can make a million and retire right there. Uh, but maybe this, this book raises some of those uh, questions. Carl ha uh, has uh, a, f a fairly long experience in, in, well, he's fairly young, but a fairly long experience in Nigeria, going back to 2000. He was NDI's um, first director of the Legislative Training Affairs Program. He had a Fulbright uh, in, uh, at the University of Ibadan. Um, and he has, uh, prior to that, he had about a decade uh, working in the US uh, public policy making arena while working for John Conyers. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about his new book, uh, Dictators and Democracy in African Development, The Political Economy of Good Governance in Nigeria. And I think, and, and Carl's going to uh, open up a little bit with some of the big themes of the book. And then we'd really like this to be an informal, interactive discussion. Um, you know, we're heading right now into what could be uh, a really contentious moment in uh, Nigeria's political trajectory. Uh, I think, uh, you know, all of us are looking to these elections and the possibility um, of, of real political upheaval. Carl is looking, again, stepping back a little bit and looking at uh, kind of what has, what has accounted for Nigeria's governance patterns, whether for, for good or bad in public policy arenas. Uh, and I think he talks a little bit about, um, uh, rather than we generally attribute it to uh, whether poor state capacity or it's, uh, it's such a diverse country, it's impossible to govern. Many other theories, I think uh, uh, Carl is, is looking a little beyond that to what, um, what drives these. So, so Carl, I want to turn to you 15 minutes or so. Um, as you wish, and then we're going to open up for questions, and uh, I'll warn you, they may come from all over. As I say, everyone's looking at February right now, but uh, <laughs> you're, you're very able to answer them all. Um, so why don't we turn to you now? Okay, um, great. And thanks so much for um, the invitation to CSIS. It's great to be back here, and it's uh, my school outside of school, so I come here as often as I can and get uh, supplement my education. So... Um, Nigeria uh, is disproportionately represented, perhaps, in a lot of the literature on Africa. Um, it has produced a lot of scholarship over the years and a lot of uh, really good scholarship. And so following my introductions to the country, um, as you pointed out, um, and so clearly I'm l perhaps less young than I look if I've done all those things. <laughs> um, and uh, what I wanted to do in this book was to get past the idea of political analysis as history and to get past history as uh, simply a, a summary of events. And so there are a number of ways that African scholars have tried to do that um, over the years. And, and so one uh, common explanation that emerges for government performance, which is the overall thing that I'm trying to explain in the book, uh, has to do with resources and oil in particular. So uh, the paradox of plenty and the idea that uh, 
if you have a lot, that, um, uh, that this can create reckless spending and be a pathway to corruption. Um, and uh, Adam Jaworski and a number of scholars have flipped that around and also said, well, sometimes states don't perform well with, when states are poor. So that s sounds like bad news for Africa, uh, for countries that have resources, because either you're too rich or you're too poor to succeed. So, um, so that's uh, confounding. Another common explanation just simply looks at regime type. Is it a democracy? Is it a dictatorship? Is it somewhere in between? Um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons why democracy is better for people. But I think that democracy by itself, as that second possible explanation, uh, really is an incomplete explanation for what explains uh, variation performance. Under some circumstances, dictators do have incentives to provide public goods to the people. Um, and one thing that I think many scholars agree on is that they do this under circumstances where they believe they have a long time horizon. That is, that they can look into the future and they feel relatively secure in office. And that seems to be a situation where dictators are uh, perhaps willing to provide public goods and good policy performance. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes about what I mean by um, policy performance. Another very common explanation, especially in Nigeria, um, it has to do with ethnicity. And so there are some important cross-national studies that, uh, for example, look at the overall level of ethnic diversity in a country and economic performance, and economic growth per capita, or, uh, or other metrics. And in that cross-national research, the inferential assumption is that if there's a lot of diversity, then people uh, have difficulty disagreeing on good national policies, or uh, that they are too focused on serving their own narrow group's interests, so something like Kenya, perhaps, um, under Moy. Um, and so that makes a lot of sense, um, and that has certainly been part of Nigeria's story, but I wanted to look at, uh, at ethnicity in one country over time and to try to think about it in the way that it shapes political bargaining at the center. So I'm really only looking at politics at the national level and at policy performance at the national level. And, um, and so to look at how ethnicity informs um, that pol policy making at the national level and to not go into those details that other scholars of Nigeria have done very effectively, which is who gets what. That's not actually a question that I attempt to answer directly um, in the book. Another favorite explanation, I think, in research on Africa and especially in Nigeria is the idea of leadership. And so, um, and this is because Nigeria's late great novelist Chinua Achebe began one of his short uh, classic books by saying the trouble with Nigeria is squarely a problem of leadership. And so I talk about that a little bit in the introduction. I talk about all of these uh, ideas. And uh, one, of, one of the things that I point out is that uh, a younger generation, a slightly younger generation of scholars like Igosa Osage look at leadership in the way Nigerians, his compatriots, think of leadership. And he says, this is a little bit of a hangover from the nationalist era. Um, and that there's something going on here where we're allowing authority to be legitimated based on charisma. And he says, the dangerous thing about this is then we're just trusting in fate. We're trusting in fate that we've chosen a leader of virtue. And you're in sort of a, 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 a platonic philosopher king type situation where you're just hoping that you've got someone of noble virtue. And so what's interesting about that is I think the critique of that perspective has also come into the mainstream discussion outside of the ivory tower. And so um, this is very much what Ellen Sirleaf Johnson said when she wrote uh, four years ago in a book 
that Center for Global Development down the street published, where she said, you know, what's more important than institutions, what's more important than leaders is how leaders are chosen. And this is how we get into institutions. And of course, Barack Obama, when he was in Ghana a few years ago, um, said much the same thing, that you know, Africa doesn't need strong, strong men, it needs strong institutions. So, um, so I, I really wanted to uh, say, I, I wanted to, to grapple with those conventional explanations, the, the conventional ways that we think about Africa, um, and also to throw in a, a fifth one, which is also really a classic in the research, which is debt. And um, Nigeria, through the course of my research over the years, turned into a really interesting case on the question of debt because in 2006, President Obasanjo, of course, paid off and renegotiated virtually all of the country's foreign debt. So you really have um, uh, you know, five potential uh, explanations that I think are characteristic of the conventional wisdom, uh, if you will. And, and so I wanted to think about what's, what's another way, if we're not simply looking at the level of wealth, if we're not simply looking at the level of ethnic diversity, if we're not simply looking at democracy or dictatorship, what's another way of structuring the policy process? What's another way of thinking about uh, where political leverage is located? And, um, and this is an important question, I think, because this helps us get past being stuck in simply talking about elections. It helps us get past the issue du jour. Um, I mean, I remember when uh, I was working in Nigeria in the National Assembly in 2000, it seemed like every month or two someone was getting impeached. <laughs> and so uh, everybody was on edge, but um, you know, at, at first we took all of the threats quite seriously, and then we re I think we started to realize that the threats were really just threats as people were trying to figure out um, how to how to be believable and how to, how to get the other interests and the other institutions to bend and to compromise. So, um, so that's uh, what I'm trying to get past and what I'm trying to do a little bit differently. And so we can talk about um, what I try to do, I suppose. <laughs> well, if, if it's none of those things, uh. <laughs> right. Right. So this is where, um, if I guess if we were on crossfire, um, you'd be setting me up to say that it's ethnicity doesn't matter, uh, which is of course not what I'm saying. Um, to what what I turn to is an idea from political science and an idea from comparative politics. I'm a political scientist, and I look at the idea of veto players. And so veto players is, is an idea that builds on James Madison's classic insights about the separation of powers and um, about the aggregation of interests into uh, those separate, institu separate institutional manifestations. And so one of the reasons why we say veto players and not just vetoes is to get past the idea that vetoes are simply grounded in presidential systems and that they're simply grounded in the American uh, political history. And in fact, the, the scholar who made this popular isn't American at all. And so um, what I mean by this is, is uh, a, an individual, an institutional, or a collective policy actor that has the ability to prevent a policy change. So one way to think about this is simply a center of power that I'm trying to look at what are the centers of power at any given moment that policy is being made. Sometimes those centers of power are very much centered within the government, and sometimes, sometimes, they are centered outside the government. Um, if, if there's a coordinated, expansive enough collective effort that can really advocate uh, a coherent demand on the government, and perhaps have some allies within the government, then I end up counting that uh, as a veto player. And I'm very explicit about the kind of criteria that I lay out. So, you know, an example of this, uh, a good example of this, I think, is uh, 
the, uh, what I describe as the June 12th movement after 1993. So the dictator Bob Mangita steps aside in August 1993, and Abacha comes in. And uh, very few Nigerians, I think, these days have any affection, affectionate memories for Abacha's government. Um, but uh, one of the things that veto players as a comparative concept has, has argued and taught us is that to understand dictatorships, we have to understand more than the dictator. We have to understand political economy. We have to understand different interests and interest groups that don't simply go away. And that's what I think happened after August 1993 in Nigeria. So Abacha comes in. And, um, and I argue that it took him a few years, about two and a half, maybe three years, before he could really center power around his sel himself and an inner, inner clique. Um, that doesn't mean that he wasn't um, difficult and brutal to start with, um, or that he didn't have ambitions to stay in power, but what it means is that there was a, a um, a movement of June 12th sympathizers, people who wanted to honor the 1993 presidential election outside government and also inside government. And so I, I try to tell those stories and I identify um, both you know, formal institutions um, as we would in a democracy as veto players and also those kinds of um, informal institutions as veto players. And so again, just to repeat, just to, I want you to think about these as centers of power within the government and across state society divides. And so by looking at these centers of power and when they expand and when they contract over time within the Nigeria policy making space, I argue that this has a pattern of effects on two different categories of public policy. So maybe I should pause there <laughs> in case something needs clarification. Uh, I'm, I'm following. You already going to tell us the two areas of public policy. So two areas of public policy. So I look at national collective goods and local collective goods. And so for national collective goods, what I mean by this are public policies where it's very difficult to deny someone from enjoying them. And that becomes very important in economy and in political economy research because what that means is that if people aren't compelled to um, pay for them or to provide for those goods, those public goods, then they're underprovided. Um, so my favorite example of this, um, you know, might be the uh, a vaccine for Ebola right now, but we can talk about that perhaps during Q and A. Or infrastructure. Or infrastructure. <laughs> Typically, we're talking about education, health systems, um, things like that. So I use four variables common variables from the political development and from the economics literature to measure national level collective goods. So again, only looking at government performance, public policy performance at the national aggregate level. So I look at um, budget surpluses or deficits, so that's one variable. I look at inflation, and Nigeria's inflation is just all over the place over half a century. It's really something else. Um, and then I also look at classroom size, and that took me a couple of months to pull together um, because I, at, at the time I started doing research, very little of, the, of that information was even online. Some of it, more of it is online, but I spent plenty of days and weeks in dusty archives in Abaddon and Abuja and elsewhere, Lagos. And then the fourth variable is a really neat one. Um, and I, uh, I look at the clearance rate for property rights cases in the courts. So I was able to hire a law student who over four or five months gathered information on 550 property rights cases. And so we're able to look at over a period of about 35 years or so of uh, the rate at which property rights cases are resolved. Now the reason why this is a national level collective good is because there's a vast body of research that says that you have to have secure property rights to have economic development. So a visual for this is um, slums when you're driving into uh, Abuja. Um, and I've done research recently in some of those slums. 
And the reason why many of those slums are slums is not because people are necessarily poor, it's because their rights to those property don't exist or they're not protected. So in, a, in, in order for people to have an incentive to make their life better, to make their home better, to make their business more productive and so forth, they need secure property rights. So I, I take those four measures of national collective goods and, and if they, if these variables don't actually measure the concept, the thing that I'm claiming that they measure, then we would expect them to perform differently. To, that once I run the statistical tests and I do this, that they would perform differently. But across all four variables, they perform very, very similarly. So I, I spared you the PowerPoint presentation tonight. So, um, and th so that's just the national collective goods. And then the other is the local collective goods. And so again, the difference between these two categories of public policy is how they are consumed. And so with local collective goods, you are thinking about uh, public policies that can be targeted uh, either to a constituency or to an economic sector or most, the most easiest way to understand it would be to a particular area. So you build a school, but you decide to build a school here instead of here. You build it in Clara State instead of in Kaduna. And, and so that opens up the possibility that those, um, that those goods can be targeted on a political logic rather than on a needs-based logic. So um, again, this gets a little bit tricky because since I'm only looking at the aggregate level and at the national level, I don't break down who gets what for the most part. I do have some pretty detailed qualitative stories um, and I, uh, I, I did pretty extensive field research to, to document some of that. But, um, but essentially what that means is that if spending really goes up, if capital spending, if recurrent spending, i.e. spending on salaries, if they really go up, if it spikes, then something is amiss. And so, um, so I infer from that 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 is uh, patronage, either in ghost employees, um, in the case of recurrent expenditures, or in um, incomplete, un un incomplete capital projects, which are uh, famous in Abuja. Everybody knows about mobilization fees, where something is mobilized but never completed. So, so anyway, so um, I take the causal story that veto players, my, in, my causal variable sets up, and I run statistical tests against these two different categories of public policy. And what I find is that what's good for one category of policy is less good for the other category of public policy. And so this I characterize as a dilemma. And it's a dilemma because obviously a good government and a good public policy performance needs both. You need to build stuff, you need to pay people on the local collective good side, but you also need relatively low inflation. You want fiscal budgetary discipline. You want courts that are resolving cases as quickly as they are, as quickly as they are receiving them, and you want classroom sizes that are manageable for teachers. So, um, so I suggest that this is a dilemma and that Nigeria is not alone in confronting this difficult dilemma about, again, the expansion and contraction of the policy process and how it affects these two different categories of outputs. Okay, well, <laughs> we're on the hook now um, for what uh, you talked about the role of veto players within that. So it, what is their specific role in terms of, uh, policies focused on collective public goods versus localized goods, and kind of what accounts for the difference, and wh why, are they, why are they two opposing uh, forces, let's say. Maybe some concrete uh, examples of how, what, how that plays out in education. Or sure, that. sure. Um, so, um, you know, the, the Gowan regime was a puzzle. Um, in a way, I, I talked a little bit about the uh, Abacha, the early years of the Abacha regime. And the Gowan regime is, is a tricky one to get around, but I was fortunate to interview him for uh, quite a while for this book, and he was extremely helpful. 
um, as were some of his, his, his officers and um, some of the other former st uh, military state administrators. So in the Gowan regime, um, you had um, a, a ruler who had to get the country through a very difficult civil war. And once they came out of the civil war, uh, they soon thereafter entered into an oil boom. And so um, Guan very explicitly knew, he was a very young man um, when he came to office. Um, I often joke with my students that you look at the pictures of the military coups from the 60s and 70s and you will immediately feel unambitious. Um, uh, and, um, and so he, he did what a lot of Latin America rulers did in the 1970s, which is they turned to technocrats. And uh, they knew that, because these rulers knew that they didn't have the training to actually make policy and implement policy and evaluate policy. And so something very interesting happened with Guan, which is those technocrats became very powerful. And they became known uh, in the Nigerian historical literature as super permanent secretaries. Because they weren't just implementing policy, they were making policy. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. And that's not quite what our colloquial vision for a dictatorship is. So they acquired a great deal of power. And they were operating within his um, collective institution, the Supreme Military Council. And also within the Supreme Military Council, um, and this is the only dictatorship in Nigeria's numerous dictatorships that did this sat the governors. And the governors in the 1970s, as, the, as that oil money really started picking up and really became hugely, hugely important in the economy, the governors, the military administrators, got more and more corrupt and more and more unpopular. And interestingly, uh, Yukubu Gowan couldn't get rid of them. He kept, he, there were numerous instances where he tried to do that. And so I try to tell some of those stories. And so I say, you know, on the one hand, we have this um, military dictator. On the other hand, we have this collective ruling body. And they bargain with each other. And they argue with each other. And they qu can't quite always um, come to agreement. And so that kind of regime operates differently um, than, I, than, say, uh, Obasanjo's first term from 1989 to 2003 where you have um, a larger policy space. You, so I, again, I use this characterization of expansion and con contraction. And if Gowan's regime is inclusive, but within a, a fairly, fairly narrow range of institutions, in uh, the Obasanjo government in the first couple of years, um, you have policy dispersed across these institutions and a lot of bickering. And so that ends up reflecting in the kinds of public policies that you get. Does, does that help? I think so. Okay. Uh, well, so how did it play out then in, in terms of policy outcomes? Uh, or, and, and how is it different from how things say today? I mean, how would you characterize Obasanjo and post Obasanjo, for example? Um, so, so you're yeah. saying that the governors were the veto players within the Within the Supreme Military okay. Council, that this was his inability to rein in these governors that he didn't like and that everybody knew were, were problems um, is evidence of the limits of his authority. And isn't that true for any federal leader in Nigeria also? One would hope, or one would expect to see that. Um, and so you know, this is important because it, I think it's, we have we have very Im notable slippage. I mean, I know we have a number of guests from the State Department here and, and plenty of expertise in the room where there's no shortage of examples where we have rulers um, that are backsliding on democracy. Um, and the, you know, still a few uh, quite sincere autocrats in, in Africa. And so you know, while I'm also telling this public policy story, I'm also trying to experiment with new ways of thinking about what restrains that guy at the center. Um, where do those interests come from? How are they sustained? What raises the costs for uh, that ruler to act arbitrarily? So, um, so when the policy space is, uh, is more constrained, the advantage is that 
the interests that are negotiating with each other, the coordination of veto players is easier, that there's fewer people around the table arguing effectively. And that um, statistically, I show that this ends up being um, better generally for the national public goods, but worse for the local public goods. That's actually where you get more patronage, more pork, more of that stuff that's schools being built, hospitals being built, roads being built or not being built at all, but the money is out there. Um, and so on the one hand, you can have easy coordination with a narrow policy process, or you can have a broader policy process that enhances accountability. And that was slightly different from what I expected to find, but I, I, I come back to James Madison in the book's conclusion because I think that um, a core insight of Madisonian thinking has to do with accountability um, and has to do uh, with um, not just accountability, but institutions being responsible to the people. I think that, that, that Madison's um, image has been uh, a little bit, I don't want to say hijacked, but it's been uh, glossed over a little bit um, too much in, in that he, he did have um, a genuine uh, respect for authority being grounded in the people. And that's what I think has been happening in Nigeria for the last 10 or 15 years, is that there have been these great political struggles, but there are also struggles over institutions. And there are struggles over institutions as people have tried to value them and to use them as tools for letting their voice be heard. Well, that, that's kind of interesting, because I mean, as we head into elections, and I, dear, did you have a question? Did, oh. Um, just, uh, you know, one of the complaints about Nigeria is that there is no, there's often no electoral accountability, or it's certainly not based on performance. And so what the veto power may lie with governors, or it may lie with godfathers, or it may lie with people with deep pockets, <laughs> but the last place it resides is with the people. Um, and I wonder, do you think that's changing, um, or, or, or does it, are there institutions within Nigeria, uh, within the government, that can play that role of countervailing power and, and veto power? Have they, have they played that? A legislature, a judiciary, um, or, or genuinely national institutions? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, and that is the, the million dollar question, I think, for uh, Nigeria over the next year or two. And, um, you know, one of the people who I interviewed for the book is Emeka Hidioha, who's the deputy speaker of the House of Representatives. And in June of 2000, the Senate president and President Obasanjo were in a bitter fight over uh, the Niger Delta Commission bill. And um, in a very heated incident, the president surrounded the Senate president's house with tanks and armored vehicles. And Ehid Yoha at that point was a staff person for the Senate president. And now he's the deputy speaker. And I asked him about that incident and I said, well, you know, looking back, what do you what does that mean to you now? And this is where I'm getting to your question, coming around to your question. And he said, you know, the president still tries to do stuff like that, but now he's met with civilized resistance. And the phrase, is that, the phrase that he uses is civilized resistance. And that to me was his own translation of what I was hearing in my political science hat of veto authority. And so, um, as imperfect as democracy might be, we also need to just think about bargaining over policy and where those centers of power are located. Now, looking outside the government and beyond the government, looking to people and to citizens and to civil society, um, there are a few key incidents, I think, in the last 10 years where that's really mattered and where, um, where we've seen popular pressures inform the government. You know, one was the 2006 
uh, outcry against President Obasanjo changing the Constitution to stay in office. A second was in 2010 when Yarudwa uh, disappeared from public view for five and a half months, um, a rather extraordinary moment, prolonged moment. Um, certainly, uh, the um, strike on the fuel subsidy in early 2012, and then most recently with Bring Back Our, the Bring Back Our Girls movement. So what you have there is four incidents where there was um, grassroots pressure. There was some interaction with formal institutions. Um, and, um, and so what I think, you know, what I think there's still some struggle about is exactly what the civil society disposition should be with the government. And that's obviously something that Nigerians will resolve on their own and that Nigerian civil society will resolve on their own. But, um, you know, it's very interesting. I just got back from the African Studies Association. I'm sorry I missed your <laughs> panel. I think we were running in opposite directions. But there was a great uh, conversation there about the state of research in African political parties. And one of the, there were five, Cambridge University Press, my publisher, has published five books in the last two years on African political parties. So after you buy my book, please buy one of these books. And they had all five authors on the panel, and they said, um, you know, what, so what should we do? Um, you know, what, what sort of the actionable ideas that are, should be taken away from this? And one of the things they said was that it's more important to support the organizations and the interests and the interest groups around political parties right now than to support political parties themselves. That if you want internal democracy, if you want parties that are actually responsive to people, if you want parties that have decent primaries, then support the chambers of commerce, support the human rights organizations, support the unions that are trying to get their voices heard within that, that party platform. And so, you know, that's obviously an ongoing struggle. Um, and I, I think that there's been a long period of reorientation for uh, a lot of the, the human rights community um, in Nigeria after the, the, the years of the dictatorship wound down. Um, so, so we'll see. I'm going to open it up for questions. It does strike me that the, those four, or was it four or five examples mm -hmm. that you cited? I mean, the 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 pushback by the legislature and the and public opinion on the third term and the party extension was a real example of institutions working um, yeah. and you know working and national public will working through the institutions. Um, the fuel subsidy uh, removal, which I, you know, kind of, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, it was at the same time as the Wall Street. Uh, Occupy. Uh, Occupy Nigeria yeah. movement and um, the, uh, um, you know, investigations were actually launched. I don't know that anyone, they were ever followed through, but there was a series of, 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 of big movement and uh, in the retraction um, or the, the reintroduction of, a, of, a, of half the, the subsidy, so kind of a compromise there. Uh, the bring back your girls uh, issue and so forth. Problem with some of those is that they didn't, they, they weren't sustained. They were kind of cr moments of crises that, uh, That's I don't, right. you know, and, and I guess for the, in terms of policy implication for Nigerian people and for partners of Nigeria, how is it that you begin to sustain those platforms uh, over time, on you know, I know there have been countless efforts to kind of mobilize a, tra a national constituency around corruption, and how do you <laughs> organize that to, yeah. to have any kind of effect? I mean, these elections, I know civil society is very much trying to, and others are very much trying to build kind of a platform of, of kind of consensus and common ground and violence mitigation, and you know, Nigeria is too important for. Um, for, for, for violence in the aftermath and so forth. But the challenge is how do you, so, you know, th those are very promising moments in a way that I don't know if, if they come faster and faster as each movement like that emboldens the next one and, and kind of the power of the street, you know, uh, people begin to discover that actually Occupy Nigeria can have an impact and so forth. And they were all different um, in, small but important ways. I mean, one of the things that I think was interesting about the uh, 
2010 protests against um, the invisible presidency, as, as it was known, uh, is that there, it was the Save Nigeria group and other organizations that were involved were overwhelmingly indigenous. I mean, these were really local um, growths um, within Nigerian civil society. But the other interesting thing is that their demands were pretty clear and straightforward. Um, it, fire the electoral commissioner, give us electoral reform, swear in the vice president so that this country has a president and the cabinet should do its job in making that happen. So those, but those are good short-term demands, and they didn't speak to sort of the longer-term demands. Um, so after they effectively won, um, there wasn't any question of what's next. Um, you know, people forget in the United States that the Move On organization started with Bill Clinton's impeachment. I mean, nobody even remembers that now. Um, and so, you know, sometimes you have organizations that uh, are really able to translate the one issue where they first get attention, get momentum, into something more sustained. And uh, I'll leave it to the sociologists and the experts on social movements, uh, you know, to maybe and technology and technology, <laughs> yeah, to maybe answer that. Yeah, don't don't let anybody over thirty do your website. <laughs> Deirdre. Uh, hi, Deirdre Le Pen. I just wanted to inject a comment about these uh, sort of burst flashes in the pan, as you've described them. They actually are carrying on, all of them. I mean, all of these movements are still very much alive in Nigeria from the experiences that, uh, that I've had over the last few years. For example, the uh, 2010, uh, the Yardua disappearance, I mean, the issue of the North getting its rotation as a presidency is still very much alive, and that was fundamental to that. The strike over the fuel subsidy and the Occupy Nigeria movement, it is very much alive along, among the youth. There are youth meetings all over the country all the time uh, discussing that issue. And the Bring Back Our Girls is an ongoing event. So I, I really do think that these actually do continue as an undercurrent. Thanks, uh, Richard America, Georgetown uh, Business School. Uh, you're concerned about corruption. There's a group of uh, economists at uh, Ondo State University and at, at the University of Baden who created the West African Society on Business Ethics. And I'm on their board of trustees. We're setting up business ethics programs all over ECOWAS at business schools, about 50 ultimately, and we're, we're hoping that the World Bank, USAID, major corporations will sponsor these. We believe that the long-term, or part of the solution long-term, is to change management culture through education, including in the public sector at all levels, senior and middle levels, as well as uh, people studying for degrees. So that's, that's a concrete project that will last for the next 40 years or so, we hope. But that's a, uh, maybe another thought is kind of the growing cadre of um, private sector players who have come to their wealth fairly independent of the state and patronage networks and so forth. Do, do they become, does that business sector become a much more powerful kind of uh, veto power um, yes. going forward? I mean, that you, can, you can imagine a whole lot of kind of new pockets of, of or centers of power, as you, right. as you call it, that get us beyond kind of the godfathers um, and, and, and the old style. And then we're, we're, you want to answer that and we'll come back to, to how. I mean, I will also expect the conversation about corruption to be very different with oil at $60 a barrel than at $110 a barrel. Um, because what that's going to do is it's going to create a conversation about scarcity. And when you have scarcity of financial resources, scarcity of money, then people, politicians are much more careful about what, 
how many people they can pay off and what they're able to spend money on, and citizens are going to be um, in a position to demand more as well. Um, but I wanted to tie back to Deirdre Lepin's point as well. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think that's absolutely right about, you know, these movements and sustaining themselves and reinventing themselves and so forth. Um, you know, one of the groups that I think is doing really interesting work right now is the Doing Democracy movement. Um, and um, on the U.S. side, um, Act for Accountability has popped up. And one of the things that they're talking about right now to sort of create a solidarity with the anti-corruption work going on in Ondo and at University of Abaddon and places like that is, um, let, you know, let's get the Ministry of Finance back to publishing the revenue transfers to the states, which they, you know, they used to do, and sometimes they do it, but, you know, just get it up on the web. And... <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, so I mean, I think it's it's a matter of um, simplifying things so that you can bring new people in, sustaining it, and also um, that the that the issues become coalition building tools. I mean, in in other work that I've done on Nigeria, you know, one of the things that I found was a really important transformation point for civil society organizations was when they built alliances, when the, issue, when the common denominator on the issues that they worked on shifted so that they built alliances. And this is, in fact, what's happening in the housing rights movement in Nigeria right now in the slums, um, is that uh, organizations that were working simply on providing water uh, into Luke Bay or into Chike or in the slums and the FCT, um, you know, suddenly become much more interested in titling. And so they're working with you know, lawyers all of a sudden um, because there's lots and lots of people who need help in that regard. So, um, so I, uh, you know, a few narrow responses and hopefully a broader one. Howard? Um, Howard Jeter, I was a former US ambassador to Nigeria. And one of the things that um, I think that your paradigm is one way of looking at Nigeria. The other paradigm would be, up until very recently, a um, political economy that's been predominantly dominated by the military. And the real politics of the country took place within that military, one can argue. Um, one of the things that uh, President Obasanjo did that doesn't get a lot of attention, but he purged the military, particularly at the level of colonels, because these were the people who formed their own center of power and who could carry out coups, and he eliminated that. And I'm, I'm interested, I will be interested in seeing whether your analysis in your book deals with um, the Governor's Forum, which uh, has emerged as a, as a real, you talk about your Adua and the succession yeah. and all of that. It was the Governor's Forum that played a large, large role in that. And as a collective, governors are, in their own right, very powerful. But as a collective, that power is magnified. So uh, you have these new centers of power that are emerging all the time. Thank you. Should I take that? Any, um, why, don't you, why don't you go to that and then we'll, oh yes, here and then there. We'll take two of you. Hi, I'm Barbara Simmons. I'm Dean of International Education at William V.S. Tubman University in Liberia. And one of the things that we uh, work towards is uh, students who what we call are self-transcendent because we're looking at leadership. We had um, had the ambassador from South Africa to talk about Nelson Mandela as a transcendent leader. Are we being uh, Pollyannish to think that by producing students, I mean, is that too far in the future to really address the issue of dictatorships now? 
Hi, thanks for a great talk. Uh, Belinda O'Donnell, University of Oxford. Um, I'd like to ask you, uh, what were some of the other things for you researching this book that were really counterintuitive? Um, I, I think for me, studying Nigerian politics, um, as somebody that hasn't been in the game for that long, um, I met uh, Goan, and he is now 80 and has a global health focus, so I'm sure there was a lot of things in this book that are pretty counterintuitive. Start with the role of the military. You kind of dismissed leadership at the beginning, so maybe <laughs> as a factor, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that, if it's still important. And then this question of the... Yeah, um, Bassandra's handling of the military during your term as ambassador and, um, uh, and in those initial years was really important. And it's not something that I think um, subsequent presidents could handle quite as well. Um, one person who has also, who's written about that in an in interesting way is uh, Bayo Adekanye, because he actually documented who went into the private sector once they retired in 1999 at the transition. And there's also a fair amount written about the PDP, the ruling party, during those early years and the disproportionate share of military officers on the board. And part of that was to smooth over the transition, but I think part of it also was just they weren't quite sure where to go. Um, and so, uh, you know, fortunately what you have now in the country, I think a, a much um, richer set of opportunities in public life and in the private sector where people can go um, and be active and be visible and be intellectually stimulated and all of these things. Um, again, if the economy starts contracting, those opportunities will become no more limited. The Nigerian governor's form is also a really important part of the story because one of the things that I argue in the book and that is forms the basis for an essay I just finished um, is, is the bargain, of course, between the North and the South which is 100 years old this year. And, um, and the basis of its awkward identity as a country, um, that is the British brought the Northern uh, Protectorate and the Southern Protectorate together 100 years ago. Um, and so if one of those units feels like the other unit is violating that bargain, then it's not just a question of presidential elections, it's a question of deeper historical politics and cultural antipathies. And the governor's forums and the various governor's organizations become, I believe, tools for coordinating those interests across the states and across the zones and across the socio-cultural units in the country. So, um, you know, so there's one or two incidents, for example, in the core historical chapter where I say this might have happened around 2002 when there was a fight over um, offshore oil, but it didn't happen um, in the way that I talk about veto players because the geographical presence of this, um, the geographical spread of this um, interest wasn't um, broad enough and sustained enough to, to meet that, that need. So, um, but in, you know, I also leave some of that to future research. And um, you know, there have been, great waves of research from scholars in Africa on comparative federalism. And I think that that's one of the next directions is when are states able to come together and when do they fail to come together um, when they need to speak to uh, the federal government. Um, so the question of leadership, yes? Um, you know, I'm very, I'm fairly careful about this, I think, and um, uh, and and James Madison is careful about this too. So uh, let me say a couple of things about how I deal with this. One is that, so Achebe in this book, you know, has this great quote that everybody quotes: "The problem is a problem of leadership." Then he also has this passage later on where he talks about corruption, and he says, "Corruption will cease to exist in Nigeria when corruption becomes inconvenient." So 
let's make corruption inconvenient. And how do you do that? And that, I think, we learned from Rabadu and from others who were anti-corruption officials that you need more than a person. Having said that, um, from one educator to another, um, you know, I, what James Madison says, I mean, he, he, everyone in college learns his great quote where he says, if, angel, if men were angels, no government would be necessary, right? What they don't teach you in college is this quote at the Virginia Convention in 1788 where he says, is there no virtue in, among us? If not, then we are a wretched lot indeed. <laughs> so there, you know, there is no extreme position. Um, having said that, you know, I think that the, and I have to be very careful because some of my students are in the audience, uh, you know, I think what you want to teach is capacity for self-judgment. I think you want to teach autonomy. You want to teach self-sufficiency. You want to teach the, the tools of good citizenship. I mean, this is what John Dewey tried to instill on the American education system 100 years ago. We're still trying to figure that out. And I think that that's more than just teaching virtue. I, I think that that's, I think teaching judgment, teaching critical thinking skills and all of these things um, is, um, I think that's I think that's hard, and I, and I think that uh, I think that's really the way I see the, the direction to go in the classroom. Um, so the last question, surprise. Yes. In the Counter counterintuitive developments uh, in the course of the book. Mm. Well, first of all, I never thought it was going to take me this long. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the first counterintuitive thing. I mean, the other thing is that uh, I. I presented my findings as if, um, it, in my discussions just now, as if everything came out as I expected. And my findings on the local collective goods were actually the opposite of what my hypothesis predicted. And that's why I told an accountability story, or that's how I came to the accountability story. That if you've got this many veto players in the government arguing with each other and they can't keep inflation down, that also means they're checking each other. That also means they're watching who's getting what. And so that's the accountability story and sort of, sort of the big theoretical frames. Um, I mean, that's certainly the part that I completely didn't expect to find. Um, I mean, the other thing that I would say is that it has been an extraordinary personal journey to come back to people again and again and again. So. You know, if, if you're at the early stages of a long dissertation journey, hopefully it won't be as long as mine. And, um, and, and keep thanking those people and being good to the people who open their homes to you and give you rides and give you food and explain how to pronounce names to you. Because it's amazing where they'll be 10 years from now. I think we're going to, oh, me. One question we always give me. Um, Prerogative. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure I got the definition of uh, uh, who, what makes a group a veto player. So my question is, would Boko Haram qualify or not qualify? And, and then you mentioned the North-South 100-year bargain. I was just thinking, you know, we were in Nigeria at the same time, although we didn't meet then. And I'm wondering, one of the things that Jonathan just did is the national conference, which was always an issue in around 2000. Do you see it having a, any impact on the, on the tug of war between the North and the South? Yeah, um, two good questions. Um, I mean, I didn't have to treat Boko Haram in the book because it was more recent. Um, although I do touch on it in the conclusion, and if you're interested in my views on Boko Haram, I published a piece in 2013 in the Journal of Intervention and State Building where I talk about Boko Haram in particular and compare it to the Niger Delta movements and so forth. I would say no, and one of the reasons why I would say it, that I wouldn't treat it as a veto player is um, because their preferences are so indecipherable that it's hard to say they're sustained across issues. Um, and, they're, and, they're, and they really are 
parochial, um, you know, in a sense that what they say and what they actually do and the, and the, the areas that they are, um, you know, really decisive um, uh, players remains fairly narrow. I mean, there's a risk of violence in many, many parts of the country, but um, so I, w I would, if I was writing it today, I would talk about them more and I would grapple with that, but ultimately I would say, no, unless this other thing happens. Um, you know, if, if there's some sort of, and I'm not proposing that this would ever happen, but if there was some sort of bizarre alliance between, say, uh, traditional elites in Sokoto and traditional elites sympathetic to Boko Haram in the Northeast, maybe. And I don't think that will happen. I don't mean to predict that, but that's the kind of thing I, w I would look for. Um, what was the other? Uh, yeah, the conference. National yeah. conference. You know, the national conference, it's striking how uh, under relevant it has become and how quickly that happened. Um, I don't mean, I, I'm not entirely surprised, but it also, from what I understand um, from some of the people that I spoke to involved in the conference and those who should have been involved in the conference but were not formally invited, uh, that the whole subtext of the conference was North-South. <laughs> Um, and so, um, uh, so now that it's over, that message has been delivered, and um, you know the coalition that Jonathan hoped to build across the north maybe has been built. We'll see. Kind of leads me, and I just I, I think we do have to wrap up, but it does kind of lead me to: Can you orchestrate those veto players? You know, the, the things that you mentioned, um, the fuel subsidy protests, uh, the, you know, Yarajua, the, the third term thing were, were kind of organic responses in a way that grew up and they were powerful enough seen, you know, you wonder what accounts for those issues rising up to that level of, of actual influence. Bring Back Our Girls had that kind of, that spread, but did it have the political influence, the policy influence in the end? Um, yeah. I'm not sure, I, it's not totally clear what Bring Back Our Girls policy drive was because you, it's not just a question of bringing, bringing back the girls, that's, you, that doesn't, that's not a policy um, choice. So, you know, you, you do wonder, and maybe this gets back to the question of leadership, does it take a, a savvy political leader to capture, identify, capture, and orchestrate that kind of a, a, a national kind of veto movement, mm. um, if you will. Um, so, you know, what I take away from this is, you know, why do those happen the way they do? Um, and also kind of how do, you, how do you sustain them over time on kind of the more enduring questions versus response to crises and then, um, as, as you just say, they remain, but they lose their, their kind of sustaining political influence over time. Maybe questions for the for for the next book, but um, uh, it does raise some. Your, you know, the whole the whole argument does raise kind of some interesting questions of where the openings for real genuine change might be. Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know if you're thinking about when regimes change, and we and if we think about each regime as a configuration of veto players or centers of power or whatever. We don't want it to be too frequent. And if it's too frequent, then something's wrong in the way you're studying this question. Um, you know, and I think as far as Bring Back Our Girls or any other movement is concerned, it, it's not simply being captured by a politician. I don't think that's what you're suggesting. It's more like an alliance. And if it's an alliance, that means that those social movements, those civil society coalitions or organizations maintain some measure of independence. So here's a quick story from field research. I was interviewing a senator from uh, the Southwest, a Yoruba senator, senator, and I said to him, you know, you're trying to do these different things. You're trying to build a constituency. You're trying to increase your profile. Did you ever think about going to hometown associations? That is, these community-based organizations that work in the villages and use repatriated money from the cities to build the villages. And he said, 
you know, I know the hometown associations, I'm a member of one, but I won't go to them for politics. And I said, why? He said, because they scare me. And they scared him because they were so fiercely independent and tried to stay out of politics. And USAID, just a couple of days ago, had a really thoughtful exchange um, down at the National Press Club about those kinds of organizations um, and thinking about US foreign policy strategy and what do we do with the groups that are just focused on development and should we push them harder into democratization? Just thinking this through. And um, that senator's story um, you know, always struck with me and I think there's a larger lesson there for the larger social movements like Bring Back Our Girls that you're talking about. Um, that politicians do need them actually, um, but, they, but they're only going to be valuable to the extent that they're also independent. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, listen, Carl, thank you so much um, for this. I uh, certainly learned a lot. We, we have copies of your book in the lobby um, and a swiper if you have a credit card. Um, so please join me and welcome to another glass of wine and, and a cup of coffee. Thanks, Thanks, Carl.